Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. That gets me in the Christmas spirit. I don't know about you. You can be seated if you'd like. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Can you make our online family feel welcome? Believe it or not, they can hear you guys when you just give them a hand clap or a shout. And so we pray that they feel welcome today and that you guys, and as well as them, they've had a great uh, Thanksgiving week. I don't know about you. I had a great Thanksgiving week. We actually uh, done the traditional uh, hog killing. Okay. There's three of us excited about that, and I think we were the only three out of this crew that was there. Uh, but we're excited about it, right? We may not be excited about it yesterday, but we were, we're going to be excited about it when it's really cold and you guys are eating Vienna sausages. It's kind of what I'm thinking. But thank you for being here today. I, don't, I, was, uh, I was in the office. I don't know that Pastor Tammy mentioned it, but thanks for your giving to Falcon's Children's Home. It was a great uh, week this week down there. They had a great harvest train. Uh, I didn't get the complete total of how much money or how much commodities they received, but honestly, whatever they get, they are greatly appreciated. And so thank you guys. You are always faithful uh, to give and always faithful to, to give to those causes and to those needs. And so we just honor you for that this morning. Uh, Pastor Tammy leads the way for our conference uh, in that and gets to present those things uh, at Harvest Train. And if you don't know what that is, look up Falcon's Children's Home or the Royal Home. Uh, it is worth an investment. It is worth feeding into that financially, planting some seed there. Uh, it, is, it is amazing what they do with so many uh, uh, kids that have been orphaned. And uh, it's amazing what they do with the royal home as they have these young uh, unwed mothers that don't have anywhere to go. And they offer them an, uh, a place to be. And in turn, uh, it keeps them from having an abortion. Let's just be honest, if I can throw that out there. Uh, it keeps them, it gives them a place to go and a place to find help that they don't uh, end the life. And so, man, what a great ministry that is. If you've thought about it or talked about it or you wondered what it was, uh, Google it, get online and check it out. It is beautiful uh, just to go down there and watch those kids and watch those uh, ladies and those, those babies. And so we just honor you for your giving. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking this morning that you guys have already had a big, huge Thanksgiving meal. Okay, the only people quieter than the folks in here this morning are the ones online, and I can't hear them at all. So I didn't know if y'all were still in like a turkey coma or what this morning, uh, but I'm just going to ask you again to give God a hand clap of praise, believe it or not. Uh, he, uh, he, he loves that. He inhabits that, and so we just give him glory this morning. I'm going to talk to you about the greatest thing. Uh, if we ask everyone in this room, we say, what's the greatest thing that ever happened to you? What's the greatest thing that ever happened? What's the greatest? What's the greatest? And we could probably go around the room, and some of us would immediately run to our kids. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was my children. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was my grandkids. If I'd have had grandkids before I had kids, I'd have never had kids. Y'all know the story. And some of you would say the greatest thing that ever happened to me was when I met my spouse, or the greatest thing that ever happened uh, but if we got down to the nitty-gritty and we asked you what the greatest thing that's ever happened to you, and you had a moment to process, you would probably, no, no offense, slip by your grandkids, you'd probably scoot on by your kids, you'd probably almost dismiss the thought that uh, your wedding was the greatest thing that ever happened to you, and you would have a revelation even in your spirit that the greatest thing that ever happened to me was when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was to find the love and the peace that God gave me. the greatest thing that ever happened to me, if I wanted to rewind a little bit farther, a little bit further, was the day that someone invited me to church, the day that someone told me how much they loved me and invited me to the house of God, that someone cared enough about me to say, hey, I know you're going through a tough time, I know your life's in shambles, I know whatever, and maybe they didn't speak it, but you knew what they were talking about, and they said, I'm praying for you, and I'd love to see you in church on Sunday, come and sit with me on Wednesday night, we want to see you in the house of the Lord. And so when I think about the greatest thing that's ever happened, we're going to experience those moments for the next few weeks, the greatest thing that's ever happened to mankind as we get closer to Christmas, as we talk about the thing that we're going to celebrate here. And, and honestly, it's crazy, isn't it? In three or four short weeks, we're going to be celebrating Christmas, and it seems like vacation was just over. And so I'm going to challenge you today to process your greatest thing. What is the greatest thing that ever happened to you? What's the greatest thing when you prioritize the things in your life? And, and I'm not going to be uh, ruthless about it, but your greatest thing should really be 
the fact that you realized and you had revelation of the love that God had for you when you received his son Jesus as your Savior. That should be the greatest thing. I know the next greatest thing has to be somewhere with your spouse and your kids and your grandkids, and you could put them all on that second line if you wanted to, but there's a lot of things that fall under that that we have given priority to the greatest thing in our life. We have given priority to chasing the dollar. We've given priority to chasing status. We've given priority to doing anything and everything else over the thing that if we had a conversation, you would tell me it was the greatest thing that ever happened in your life was to serve God and accept him as your Savior. And if I looked at our lives and we just began to walk through our daily uh, routine or through our weekly routine, we would find that we don't put the greatest thing on top where the greatest thing should be. And we find ourselves doing everything else. We find ourselves prior prioritizing everything else. We pri find ourselves prioritizing all the thises and all the thats because we're worried about the what ifs. And we find ourselves leaving the greatest thing that ever happened to us maybe out six days at a time. And then we show up on Sunday and we have revelation in these moments of times of praise and worship that the greatest thing is, in fact, Jesus Christ, the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And if Jesus Christ is the greatest thing that ever happened to you, why aren't you telling everybody? Why aren't you showing everybody? Why are we putting everything else? It's in, listen, our priorities will reveal without saying a word what the greatest thing in our life is. And when the greatest thing in our life it's going to be on top. It's going to be where we put our time. It's where we're going to put our investment. It's where we're going to put our money. It's where we're going to put our attendance. It's where we're going to put our talent. The greatest thing. And so when we ask you, or when I ask you this morning, what's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? I want you to process that. I want you to see, and on top of that, when you realize what the greatest thing is, you may still believe your kids are the greatest thing. You do that. I mean, I have, I'm asking the question. There's, no, there's, there's definitely a great answer, but maybe your answer isn't the same as everybody else's. I want to read out of Colossians. We've been talking about Thanksgiving and uh, thanks for giving and all the things this month, and we, we try our best to just educate you, right, equip you in, with the Word so that you understand what giving is all about. It's not a, it's not a, a, a requirement, right? It, it's not something that we force anybody to do. It's not something that we make anybody do, or the only way you can be a part of our club, our family, our community of church is that you give, and that's not the case here. I don't know if it's the case anywhere, if I'm honest with you, but it's not the case here. And so when we talk about Thanksgiving, we find ourselves thinking about finances, especially this month, because that's when this church tries to put a little bit of priority on giving financially so that you have an understanding. I, I don't have the budget in front of me for next year or the budget in front of me for what this year was. But in the next few weeks, or more than likely in January, we'll hit on that so that you know what it costs to operate this building. And I can promise you, these lights aren't free, this heat's not free, those chairs weren't free, keeping this building up's not free, and all those things. And so we're going to move past that today. Is that good? Let's move past that today and talk about Thanksgiving. As we just finish the turkey and the dressing, or maybe today you're going to have your last turkey sandwich of the year because you've done all you can do with it. And, and the honey's not cooking today because the refrigerator is still full of turkey and dressing. And so honey's not cooking. We're gonna, today is the last day of our Thanksgiving meal, and we're going to knock that out. And we're going to move a little bit past that. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through 6, it says, Continually earnest, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. I'm wondering if our prayer life just becomes a to-do list for Jesus, a, a, a honey-do list for God. I wonder what our prayer looks, life looks like, and so I'll throw that on verse number two and verse number three. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open, us, open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. I'm going to stop there for a second because in our prayer life, if it's only your five minutes in the morning, your 10 minutes while you're getting ready for work or whatever your morning time looks like, maybe your morning for those of you who work third shift, is it 5 o'clock in the evening? Maybe for your morning is a little bit earlier if you work second shift because you got in so late. Maybe you day shifters at 4, 30, 5 o'clock, whatever that looks like. Maybe that's your morning time for prayer. In that morning time for prayer, I'm going to challenge you to maybe pray like verse number 3, to pray that God would open for us a door for the Word so that we, so that you and I can speak the mystery of Christ, right, for which I am in chains. Because... But why would I be in chains to, to Christ? Because he's my priority, because he is the greatest thing, because he is the biggest thing in my life. 
And so when we have that revelation, then we automatically start our prayers off with, thank you, Lord, not give me, Lord. Thank you, Lord, I need, Lord. Thank you, Lord, I want, Lord. No, we begin to thank him and give him praise and glory, and it's not just in the month of December. It's not just when we're praying over Thanksgiving dinner. It's not just when the family gets together at Christmas, but we are thankful that 365, 24-7, and every morning I'm going to start off and I'm going to say, God, thank you. I'm going to be vigilant in that. I want God to know that I am grateful. I want God to know that I don't just spend my November thanking him, but I want to thank him in January, and I want to thank him in March, and I'm going to thank him in May, and I'm going to thank him in July. And so we find ourselves putting priority on giving God thanks because he is the greatest thing. Priority on believing that God can open up doors for us because here's the thing, people want you to speak to them. There's only 3% noisemakers. Let me help you. All the bantering we see on the news media, all the foolishness we see in the streets of different cities with all their signs and all their, uh, all, all their uh, memorabilia, if you want to call it that, all of their foolishness, there's only 3%. But the sad part is the media is giving that 3%, 97% airplay so that it looks like to us, everybody's against us. And whether you like that or not, okay, I'm not trying to be political and it wouldn't matter if I was, I get, I'm up here, right? But they're giving us a picture of what they want us to see, not what we could see. When Pastor Tammy and I were in New York last year, Probably my dreaded trip. If you want to have a dreaded trip, that was mine. And I said, I have no desire to go to New York. I don't want to go to New York. I've seen on the news. I've seen the media. I know what's going on. I don't want to be a part of that foolishness. Don't want to get locked in somewhere. Don't want to get caught up in it. Don't want to be in this. And we got there and there was nothing. Nothing. I found out that not only does New York love America, they really love America. We would go down the street, and every building had flags on it, all the way down as far as you could see, 30 feet in the air, big flags, flying for the glory of this great nation that we live in, and it's nothing like I saw on TV. When we went to, when we went to Trump Tower, and whether you like him or not, it's worth a visit. If nothing else, go to the bathroom. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yep, any other bathroom will be inferior after that. But I'm just saying. And so we went to Trump Tower, and the news media is out front. I'm like, dude, you know, we're kind of, what's going on? What's going to happen? What's getting, what are we going to get caught in the middle of? And there, here I come back playing back all the foolishness I've seen on the news media, and they're talking about there's going to be a protest at Trump Tower, and there's going to be this and that. And so we're like, okay, we're inside. Let's see what's happening. Police line up out front. Guess what? Big one. It was a big one. News everywhere. Guess how many people was there? Twelve. And it wasn't the disciples, the 12. And it made me realize as they were zooming in on this little cluster and doing their media business and doing their thing and, and promoting the stuff that they still promote, I got a clearer picture. I got a really clear picture. And here's the thing about New York. I'd go back tomorrow. I found out that it, was, it turned out to be my greatest trip right out of my most, uh, I don't know, least desired trip. And if we're not really careful, that's what we do. That's what we allow the enemy to do. We allow him to put everything else in front of our faces, in front of our eyes, in our minds, and we forget what the greatest thing is. We forget that he's still in control. We forget that he can be our priority because we are his. We can be everything that he's called us to be because he loved us enough, trusted enough to call us that, and I've got to get on with it, don't I? And so when we speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside redeeming the time. Sometimes we don't have to charge them like a bull, right? I don't think anybody in this nation anymore charges anybody like a bull with the gospel. Very few people, if anybody. But the fact that we don't charge them at all, that we don't approach them at all, is the scary part for me. And so I'm going to challenge you this season that we're going to approach people. We don't have to charge them. We're going to ask God to open up doors for us so that we can share the mysteries of Christ or the, or the promises of God or the goodness or the greatness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he's going to open a door that we begin to walk in, and we walk in freely knowing that God has opened this door. God has given us wisdom and direction in our minds and in our mouth, and we're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ this season because he is the greatest thing that ever happened to us. It says in verse number 16, in verse number 6, it said, let your speech always be with grace. That's tough, isn't it? Maybe you're not like me. 
Right, but that's tough. That's one that I don't, don't come automatic for me, right? It don't come automatic because I'm, I'm automatically human. But by choice, I am a Christian. By choice, I am redeemed. By choice, I try to walk out what God has asked me to do. And so in turn, that would be your decision as well. Let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt. When he called us to be the salt of the earth and to be a witness for him, I've chased that, I've chased that rabbit every direction you can just about chase it. Because I have found that there comes a time when you realize there's, that's enough salt. There comes a time when, okay, that's probably enough. There comes a time when you're no longer being affected, but you're making now the taste, make it taste bad. Yeah, some of you families know that every time you have a, a Thanksgiving or Christmas or family gathering, you don't have to preach. Anybody that needs that, just take that real quietly. You don't even have to say amen. It's not always time to preach. He didn't call us to preach to everybody. He called us to love everybody. And sometimes, and I know for me, when I was lost and unknown without God, and even still, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day, if I'm honest. I'd rather see someone minister to me, not necessarily have to hear someone minister to me. And so if Christ is the greatest thing that ever happened to me, why am I not sharing it with everyone I know? Why am I not praying that God would open up the doors? Why is my morning prayer not thank you, God, for this other day, this next day, this opportunity, God. I know this day is filled with 24 hours. And God, in this 24 hours, I am grateful for it. I am grateful that you're going to see me through it. You're going to open doors for me to love people and even necessary tell people about the goodness and the greatness of God. In John, John number 14, John 14 and 12, it says, Verily, or very truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Wow, what has he been doing? He's been loving people, right? You don't find a whole lot of messages where he was up on, the, up on his soapbox and he was spitting and spewing and condemning and all those things, but we found him loving people. We found him touching people right where they were at. We find him and found him in their worstest of their worst, Jesus walking right into the midst of us. We found that Jesus rolled right in. He prayed for people. He laid hands on people. He healed people. He loved people. So what's our mission? In John chapter 12, uh, 14, verse number 12, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. What are you doing? You see, I believe that when my opinion becomes greater than God's, I'll do a whole lot of bantering. I'll tell you all the what fors and the what ifs and what you shouldn't be doing. I'll catch myself doing that if I become of a greater priority or my thinking becomes a greater priority than God's way of thinking. But God's way of thinking, we find it biblically says, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. So what are we doing? With God being the greatest thing that ever happened to us, what are we doing? The greatest thing we could be doing is obeying his word, right? Serving him and obeying his word. He's not, a, he's not a dictator. He just lays it out for us, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Does anybody think I'm talking too fast? Because here's the thing. When I shot all my scripture to the tech team, I'm sure they went. Yeah. It'd be 1130 before he gets done first service. So bear with me. If you like auctions, you will like the rest of my message. I get lost on the bidding. Do you ever get lost on the bidding? When I'm talking about loving, no one raised their hand. I talked about love again, no one raised their hand. And I'm wondering, yeah, y'all not buying it. So here we go. So verse number 12 again. It says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So now we're not just being led by Jesus as disciples. We're not just being led physically by Jesus, but now we're being directed spiritually by Jesus. And so now we've been empowered. We've not just, we've been given, uh, I guess, direction. We've been given uh, in invitation. We've been given permission. We've been given motivation. He's given us a word to walk in. He's given us a word to walk by. He's given us a word to share. And we find ourselves making up our mind, how am I going to do this? Because he says that we can do greater things than he ever done. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I told someone one day, I said, man, I just love Billy Graham. If I ever heard anything bad about Billy Graham, y'all know how it is. I don't put too many people on a pedestal, uh, and I won't put him on one, but man, I, I just love Billy Graham. I love his ministry. I love that he was just real. I love that he didn't talk no, I mean, you know what I mean? I'm not a big word guy. You throw a lot of big words at me, I'm gone. I'm lost. Right, but I love Billy Graham's ministry. I told someone one day, I said, man, it's just awesome to me that Billy Graham walked out the Word of God and he done greater things than Jesus ever done. 
What? I said, he done greater things than Jesus ever done. Traveled farther, reached more people, saw more, more salvations, uh, ministered to more people, just done greater things than Jesus ever done. And they said, that is sacrilegious. Really? Well, here's the beauty of it. Jesus didn't have an airplane. No helicopters landed him in the middle of a, a field somewhere where he had set up to do a venue. No one... Y'all ride that one however long you're on to ride it, but he said that we will do greater things than he done. Through the news media, absolutely. Through Facebook, I don't know that he would have a Facebook page, but if he did, he'd be getting it done. Yeah, he wouldn't tell the neighbor about their dog peeing in her yard. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be talking about how the neighbor started the car real early in the morning. Don't you know some people had to sleep? He wouldn't, there would be none of that. Why would there be none of that? Because it doesn't matter. The only reason it would matter is if you think your opinion's greater. I better, I'm got to, did I tell you I need to be down by 1030? And so let's look. Because he went to the Father, he empowers us with permission, with opportunity, right? He empowers us. He's given us permission and opportunity. So we're going to read verse out of Matthew verse chapter number 28. It said, even the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Isn't that something? I found that anytime I'm successful, it's because I did what he told me to do. Uh -huh. That's a Thursday night teaching. Y'all won't show up for it, so I'll give it to you for a moment. Anytime you find yourself being successful, it is because you did or you're doing what God told you to do. Yeah, y'all can have that because when you're not doing what God told you to do, y'all know that feeling. I know that feeling, right? Holy smokes, I'm such a loser. I can't believe I fell into that. Can't believe I done that. Can't believe, can't believe I thought that. Can't believe I voiced that. Can't believe I typed that. I don't know where the delete button is. Okay, just me. You good? You good? Okay, two of us have had that situation in our lives and we've had to walk it out. And when we've walked it out, we find ourselves thinking, the only reason I got myself in that quandary, the only reason I found myself in that, in that noose is because I didn't do what he told me to do. I didn't apply what he told me to apply to my life. And then the 11 disciples went to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. We're here, right? It's at any gathering. As spiritual as we want to be, it's at any gathering. It's at a gathering where it took finances to go. It took $3,000 plane ticket. It took months to plan. It took a hotel room. It took all the things, a rental car. It took all the meals we had to prepare for while we're at that conference. And everybody, some of them come believing and some of them come doubting. Do we get tore up about that? No, we don't get tore up about it. Why? Because then we move to verse number 18. Then Jesus came to them. See, you may have rolled up in here doubting, but I can promise you if you'll open your ears and open your heart and listen to Jesus for a minute, you'll leave here knowing. And so it says, and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, capital G-O, in my, on my text at least, go, do something, right? Sometimes you have to do something. I made a statement. I don't know if I made it first service last week. Uh, it, there's so many people that want to lean on a shovel and pray for a hole. We just do. That's what we do, right? That's, we've Americanized everything. And so if I have a shovel, that don't mean you get a hole. It don't mean you accomplish anything. It just means you have the shovel. And so if I just have the word to go, and that's all I have, but I never go, then I'm not operating and walking in the power that God's called me to operate in or gave me permission to operate in. And so I can't just have a shovel and pray for a hole. The hole will never happen. I can't just have the word and pray for salvations and pray for souls and pray for, I have to go. The only way you're going to walk through that door that you're praying about in the mornings that God would open up a door that I can share the gospel of Christ, that I can love somebody that seems unlovable, that I can help somebody that seems helpless, offer hope to somebody that seems hopeless. The only way I can do that, it won't be leaning on the word and praying for it. It'll be going. And so we go. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. And so in this scripture, if you run back and get it, if you take notes or if you watch it later, you'll find that we've been given some responsibility. 
And in giving us responsibility, God will never give you responsibility without giving you opportunity. If you're the one that's still sitting around saying, I'm waiting on God, very likely he's waiting on you. If I am sitting around saying, I'm waiting on God, my bride will remind me, and you're welcome to now, that God's waiting on me. God's waiting on me. He told me to go. He didn't tell me to wait. He told me to go. What? And let's say he did. Then you become a what? A waiter. Right? They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They that wait. There's times when we have to wait, but in this scripture, he's calling us to go. Okay, let me grab back the waiting. They that wait upon the Lord. So while we're waiting, what do we do? We don't just sit on our duff and sit on our good intentions. We do what? We serve. What does a waiter do? Serve. And so while you're waiting, you still don't get to do nothing. I love y'all. Good day. That's another Thursday night. You don't have to come out. That's two. I've given you two free weeks already. And so he gave us uh, responsibility. He's given us opportunity. He's given us motivation. What's the motivation and inspiration is that we can do greater things than he ever done. And if you think he was the greatest thing that ever happened to you, surely you would want to do greater things than the greatest thing that ever happened to you so that you can walk in the fullness of the glory of God. And so we grab that. And so now... In Luke chapter 10, I'm going to give you something else. And so out of responsibility, opportunity, motivation, and inspiration, now he's going to give us direction. I think a lot of times we leave service thinking, man, I loved everything he said, but what do I do with it, right? A lot of times that's on the Holy Spirit and us listening to that. But today I'm going to give it to you in the Word, and hopefully you'll also hear it in your spirit. And so in your, in your seat, you'll find some invitations. You'll find a, a, a prayer card on the front. It's got five lines on it, these Uh, invitations. There's either four or five in your stack. I'm not sure which you got. We've been doing this for a number of years. Can Can I challenge some of you that have not participated recently? We do this twice a year so that you have opportunity to invite people without pressure, to invite people to the house of the Lord without pressure. And this one right here says that it's the reason for the season. It gives the dates of our service on December 17th at 9 30 and 11 o'clock. And you present it to somebody and say, man, I just wanted to give you an invite to church. I'd love for you to come and sit with me. Right. Because we hear, we listen. We hear people say, man, it's so hard to invite somebody to church. It's so hard to do. I don't really know what to do or how to do it. I'm going to tell you how to do it right here biblically, not because I know how, but because God showed me how. And that's what we're going to do. The other one with the five names on it, while I'm sharing this next portion of Scripture, I want you to think of the five people that you can give this card to, not the people at that church and the people at that church and the people at that church and the people at that church. We love all those people, but they have a church. Okay. They have a church. And so be thinking of five names you'll write on this. Let me share with you those that have done it for years and those who have have started not doing it for years because... If you haven't gained five friends since the last time we've done this, then get busy. I'm just saying. If the only five friends were the five friends you gave it to last time, then give it to them again. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. Quit leaning on your shovel and praying for a hole. Sure wish old John would come to church with me. Sure wish old Bob would come to church with me. I sure wish, wish Ellen would come to church with me. Sure wish Nancy would come to church with me. Okay, then here's your chance. I love y'all, okay? Wow, thank you, Pastor Tammy. Luke chapter 10. I want to share this scripture with these five invitations and this prayer card in mind, if that's okay. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Look out. All I know to tell you is when you get there, just tell them Jesus is coming. Yeah, y'all get that scripture later. Put that, make sure that one's up there so they can read that last part. Go into the, every city and every place where he himself is about to go. Come on up in there. Right? When we go some... Mm, that's not even a Thursday night. When we go somewhere as children of God, as men and women of God, as Christians, right? As, fe- as believers, as followers, devoted followers of Christ, then when we go, guess who come? Yeah, y'all can leave him in the car if you want. I need him to go to Walmart. I I need him down there when the two lanes go into one at the restaurant. That drives me nuts. I was listening with my window cracked to that monitor. My person said, please pull around before theirs. 
I'm just saying. So anyway, it says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and he sent them two by two before his face into every city and every place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest is truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, in other words, listen to me. Go your way. Now listen, listen. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Not everybody's going to like it. The media's not going to like it. Facebook won't like it. Twitter won't like it. Let me give you my version of the end of that. Who cares? We can't stop sharing the gospel because someone bucked the system. There's millions of people that are dying lost, even hundreds of thousands dying lost today, and we can't sit back on our good intentions because someone didn't like it. So we still honor the Word of God. We still go out as lambs among wolves. We still go out knowing God has called us. The wolves will be held at bay. We, if, we, if we get so focused on the barking, we will never accomplish the goal. Let the wolves howl. Let the wolves bark. But as for me, we're going about the Father's business. As for me, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. As for me, when I do what God's called me to do, it is very possible and probable and even scriptural that I'll do greater things than even he done because I will go, because I went, because I'm about my Father's business. And so go your way. Behold, listen to me. No one said it's going to be easy. No one said it's going to be a cakewalk. But I believe when we pray in the morning and say, God, open this door, it may not be a cakewalk, but it'll, it'll transition beautifully for the glory of God. It'll tr Neither, neither uh, carry neither a money bag, a knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. Verse number five. But whatever house you enter, now pay attention, verse number five through verse number nine. That's where I'm going to break down these invitations and this prayer card. Whatever, whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will find rest on it. And if it is not, it will return to you. In other words, if you don't find peace, see ya. Don't, don't cast your pearls before the swine. We wire ourselves out and we say, I I'm I'm, feel so used up. I'm so wore out. I'm so tired. You've been casting your pearls. There's... Remind me to preach on this next week, okay? Somebody. So if you find the son of peace, you've, uh, your peace will find rest there. If not, it will return to you. That's when you scat. That's when you know part of that. Verse number seven and remain in the same house. What house? The house you found peace in. Eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worth his wages. Do not go house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you. Oh, <laughs> that's tough, isn't it? If you went to my grandma's about this week, when I was a kid, guess what we had? She had, I didn't. Guess what she had? I broke, I broke fellowship with the word over this. Blood pudding. Why? That's all I'm asking. Why? Well, your grandma fixed it. You better eat it. Y'all didn't grow up and I grew up. Y'all must, must not have been as financially strapped as we were. Hey, when we killed hogs on Thanksgiving, we used everything but the squeal, and the kids made a whistle out of that. We didn't waste anything. Yeah, y'all get that later. Killing pigs. Who kills pigs? And so when you enter there, that still bum puzzles me. I probably need to ask forgiveness. That you eat whatever they set before you. Whew. I'm sweating over that right now. Verse number nine. Heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. I want to break that down so that we leave equipped, so that we're ready to make the harvest great, right? So that we're ready to see a great harvest. It says that the harvest is great and the labors are few, so pray. That's what it says. And so when we begin to pray, I started off with scripture that said pray. Pray that God would open up doors. Pray that in the morning as you offer thanksgiving to God, and then you continue and say, God, open up doors today, that I can be a light to someone that's in the darkness that I can give hope to someone that seems hopeless. God, use me today. Same thing. A harvest is great. Labors are few. Go and do. And while you wait for more laborers, do while you wait for more laborers. And then we participate in recruiting more laborers, if that's all right. 
So the Lord laid out the problem, the Lord laid out the solution, and now he's laid out the plan in this portion of Scripture, and I'm going to break that down for you. First of all, uh, he is sending us, believers, followers of Christ. He's not, he's not waiting till this house gets to a 1,000, right? We've been, we, have been, uh, we have been motivated, right? We have been on maneuvers uh, since we had 10 people in this ministry, and now that we have over 500 in this ministry, we are mobile. We are mobile in different directions, in different counties even, in different locations, in different communities. We have been mobilized for the glory of God. We're not waiting on there to be 750, though we know that's coming. We're not waiting on there to be 1,000, though we know that's coming. We don't wait on them. While we wait, he says the laborers are few and the harvest is great, so we have to man up, woman up, step up, and be the harvesters, be the laborers in the kingdom of heaven. He gave us a great way to look at it. Who can I reach? Where can I go? What can I do? He's going to break it down. It says in verse number five and six, find a person of peace. That would be one of your friends, right? So I find a person of peace. That's someone I already know, not someone that already goes to another church, but someone I already know. And so I begin to write down a name of somebody I already know that don't have a church to go to. And old, old Ralph is number one. So Ralph is my number one. So how do I handle that? I make sure that he falls in the criteria of this portion of Scripture because in verse number seven, it says to eat and drink with them. In other words, I'm going to find a person of peace. I'm going to find a friend that I've eaten and drank with that I've built a relationship with. So I found a person of peace. I found my friend that I've built a relationship for. He says in verse number nine, heal the sick. In other words, we've met a need. So I find myself now not even having to question who I put on the card. It's going to be a friend of mine, right? It's going to be a friend of mine that I've built a relationship with and I've met a need for. And now the only thing left to do, because we've been hanging out at the garage, I helped him put his transmission in. I helped him put the brakes on his wife's car. I've, I've done this. I've met a need for him. The only thing I haven't done, I followed Scripture to the T. I made a friend. I built a relationship. And I met a need. Now what? Now you introduce the gospel. And here's the beauty of that. You don't even have to do that. He says that now you say the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Verse number nine, heal the sick there. In other words, meet a need and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. And that's in that moment when you say, hey man, listen, aren't we friends? Don't we have a great relationship? Remember when I helped you change your tires on the side of the road, when I helped you put your engine in, your transmission? Remember when? And you may not have to say all that. It's, a, it's an understood situation that you have, he's your friend, she's your friend, you've met a need, and you've built a relationship. And now I would love for you to come and sit with me on Sunday, December 17th. That is, that's too simple, isn't it? Is there anyone in here that is my friend? Is there anyone here that we, you feel like we built a relationship? Is there anyone in here that I've met a need for? And if I really think that Jesus is the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life, and I have a person that's my friend that we built a relationship and I've even invested in them and met a need for them, why in the world wouldn't I want them to know Jesus? Why in the world would I want them not to... Would not, not want them to come and sit with me on December 17th while we celebrate Jesus. And so we find ourselves looking at these cards, and the first year we've done this, we, we got 890 of these back. How did you do that? Some of you took two, ta two stacks. Right. Some of you took and only used two or three of your cards. I want to tell you a story, not to convince you, the scripture has to convince you. If you're not moved yet, then anything else I say about this won't matter because it, it's scriptural, biblical. It's a mandate from heaven that anyone that you have become friends with and built a relationship with and met a need for, the greatest need you could ever meet for them is to teach them or to show them or to lead them to where they can find eternal life. So when we look at that, and I think about that, there was a young lady, and we used to have her testimony, and we thought about sharing it, and we don't have it, so we don't I have it. We didn't have it available. And so this young lady had five cards, first time their church done this. This isn't life changer exclusive, by the way. This is God exclusive. We just want to operate on it and teach you how to invite people to church. And make it easy. No pressure. And so this young lady, she had five cards. She put five names on her cards. She gave four cards out, one name left. 
Nothing was said much about it. But the one person that she held the card for whose name was on the list that she never did give the invitation to, she was inhibited because they lived a little rough and they lived a little wild. And though they were, uh, though they were not just friends and though they were not just build relationship, that it was her uncle. And though she had met a need for him, she was inhibited. Even with this easy, for me at least, this is an easy opportunity. And she didn't give the card because she was inhibited. She got a phone call the week after their special day, which for us would be December 17th. She got a call the week after our December 17th that her uncle had been in a tragic accident and it didn't make it. This young lady, I'm talking five years later, still carries his invite card. As a reminder, never do that again. Never do that again. What if I had invited him? What if he had come sit with me? What if he had given his heart to the Lord? I wouldn't be dealing with what I'm dealing with in my heart. That's not a scare tactic, by the way. It's just a reality, right? None of us are promised tomorrow. If we knew what was going to happen between now and and next Thanksgiving, we would have taken more pictures. of him. The responsibility falls on us. Opportunity has been given to us. <laughs> and the direction is clear. But we don't have to carry the load. That's his. Eighty percent of churchgoers were invited by a friend the first time they came to church. Amazingly enough, in the survey by Barna, eighty percent of non believers, non churchgoers, <coughs> stated that they would go to church or consider going to church if somebody would. in a survey by Barna is the reason this message is here. In a survey by Barna, less than 50% of present church goers ever invite a friend. We can't be that church. are too high. I'm motivated. <laughs> if we're not motivated by anything else scripturally, we get motivated that there's people dying lost because less than 50% of churchgoers invite their friends to church.
ab. A rough couple of days. And so now that we know we are the laborers, we've been given responsibility, motivation, and inspiration. And we've even been given direction, right? And so I guess the we of the house, we we have to get involved. So what if that church isn't? And what if that church isn't? And what if that church isn't? We are. We've had a mindset here for several years. Our goal is one more. Because the shepherd left the 99 to go after the one. And if I'm just real with you, I remember when I was the one. And then we got to praying about this thing. And there's over 30, there's right at 30,000 people in Wythe County and only 14% of people go to church. And so my numbers changed for me at least. I'm all about the one more, but I'm also about the 26, the, the 25,000 some odd people in this county that no one's reaching out to. So we have a new number. We have a mandate, been given an opportunity. I'm just going to ask you to stand for me. God, we love you today. Lord, we're so grateful, so thankful. God, would you just give us direction this morning? As we close this service, the number one goal right now is not so much that we have five visitation cards in our hand, invites, or that we have our prayer card filled out. The number one priority in this house right now is that everyone in here knows the Lord and has opportunity, permission to call on the King of glory. So this morning, I'll ask you, are you in right relationship with Christ today? You see the power behind whoever invited you this morning or whoever invited you the first time here or to whatever church that may have been. That maybe today would be your day to say, you listen, I had a friend that beat the odds and invited me to the house of the Lord because they were my friend and we had a relationship and they had met a need and I wanted to honor their friendship and I'm here today. And the last part is, I'm sure they invited you with expectation that when you get here, the pastor will share the gospel, and I hope I have, and I hope I am. But if you'd like to know Christ as your Savior today, would you just slip your hand up? Not a lot of fanfare this morning. But you say, Pastor, I want to be the one that hands out these invitations. I'm no longer the receiver, I'm the giver. If you just slip your hand up, I'd love to pray for you this morning. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, it's as simple to give your heart to the Lord as it was for someone to hold that door open out there this morning. He says, if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. It's all right. I'm going to pray it, and if you want to pray it with me. Just say, Heavenly Father. Thank you for loving me. God, thank you for giving your son for me. Give me of my sin. Come into my life. Make me new. For your glory. In Jesus' name. God, now for every person that said that prayer and every person that said it a year ago, 50 years ago, 
God, we just ask that you, Lord, we're first off, we are grateful and we are thankful. But we ask you, Lord, as we leave this building, God, as we declare today that we do have five friends. I'm grateful that I have five friends. We do declare today, as you give us opportunity, as you give us uh, permission, Lord, we just ask you to open the doors for us. That you'll send us to the five people that need this. If they never come, they'll know I love them. And God, would you use us for your glory? Lead us to be bold in our faith. We give you glory this morning for strength and power, for equipping the saints for your glory. In Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen this morning? Would you give God a hand clap of praise for those that raised their hand? Thank you this morning for raising your hand and being bold enough to raise your hand. I will share with you, we sometimes forget, last Sunday we had 16 people give their heart to the Lord in both services, and so we're just grateful for that. So proud of those folks, and very proud of you this morning. I I will tell you that the average Christian, listen, the average Christian will never invite any friend, not even one friend to church, the average Christian. And so just in, I guess, life changer form, I'll ask you a question. Who wants to be average? We don't want to be average. And so this week, if you need to pray about your five people, we'd love for you to do that. But if you'll fill out this card with the five names, whether you turn it in today or Wednesday night or next week, whatever. But if you'll put the names on it and leave it on the altar, we'd love to pray over these every day. That as God opens that door for you, even if it's December 16th when you finally hand out that fifth one, please hand it out if you put their name on the prayer list. But we just want to pray for your, fa- your friends Some of you may be given to family, right? But we're just going to pray that God will open the door. Will it be easy? I think it can be easy. I think God will just open the door and give you opportunity. Is that all right? If you'll fill these out, put it on the thing. Be sure to pass these out. Uh, If one's left in your car, whenever I I walk by it and it's laying in your window in February, I'm messing. I'm messing. Uh, then it'll just be laying in your wind in February. Real quick, we'd, we'd love if uh, you, anyone would like to make donations, either financial donation or donation of candy for the parades coming up this week. I know we have Marion on Friday night. We have Withfield on Saturday, and we have Christiansburg. I don't remember the date on that one. Uh, but they give out a lot of candy, trust me. Marion is probably the longest parade. If you've ever gotten to walk in that one, you will want to ride in it the next time. But it's a very long parade, a lot of people. And so candy donations are great. If you just want to drop a $5 bill, a $10 bill, or a $1,000 bill, if you drop one of them, they'll holler at me first. We need to make sure somebody's got their eye on it. But if you drop a $1,000 bill to help, to help pass out candy and just show the love of Jesus, we appreciate it. Uh, don't forget Tuesday night at 7, Dr. Susan along with Dr. Tom, uh, they do our Life Changers University. It's an in-depth Bible class. I think you'll love it. It's on Facebook Live Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Also, Wednesday night is normal. Uh, We'll be having 7 o'clock service. We love you guys. Pray you have a great rest of your week. And we'll see you Tuesday online, or we'll see you Wednesday in person. God bless you guys.